Today we're talking about the story of Flavor Earth. It's the story of how as the universe, after it had been going through a period of contraction, begins to expand again. And some of the Brahmas, who during the period of contraction have been living up in the Brahma world, a very high Brahma world, come down to this world. But this world at that point was not what it's like now. It was all water. And the Brahmas floated through space, self-luminous. They were so bright that you couldn't see the sun or the moon. And then they began to notice a film developing on the water. That was the flavor earth. And one of the Brahmas, out of wantonness, thought, what's that? Tasted it with his finger. It tasted like wild honey. So he ate more and more, and the other Brahmas saw this, and they, so they started eating. They fell on the flavor earth, consuming it. And as they did, they lost their self-luminosity. The sun and the moon appeared. The stars appeared. Then the story goes on to show how as they got more and more intrigued with lower and lower pleasures, the bodies got more coarse, the features got more coarse, the level of their minds descended until we got down to the human world as we know it now. The story illustrates an important point about becoming, where your de desires are focused is going to determine who you are, the identity you take on. And the lower the level of the, des the desire, the lower the level of happiness, pleasure, well-being that you're looking for. That's all covered by one word in Pali, sukha. Then the lower the state of your mind. As we meditate, we're trying to reverse that process. Instead of looking for our pleasures and sensuality, our fascination with fantasizing about sensual pleasures. We're going to go for the pleasure of form. We're trying to get to, back to that point prior to the flavor earth, where those Brahmas were feeding on rapture as they were self-luminous. We're trying to breathe in a way that gives rise to a sense of, sense of rapture within the form of the body. Start out by noticing some spot in the body that's especially sensitive to how the breathing feels. And try to protect it as you breathe in, so that there's no tensing up in that spot as you breathe in, as you breathe out, or between the breaths. You don't have to mark the spot between the breaths by squeezing it. Just leave it wide open. And as you allow the blood to flow there without any interruption. A sense of fullness will develop. It's not much to begin with, but you tend to it like a small fire, and after a while it begins to grow. And you think of it running down the different nerves in the body, running down the blood vessels in the body. So eventually everything is filled with that sense of fullness. You want to learn how to appreciate this, because this is a pleasure, this is a sense of well-being that doesn't have any drawbacks. You're not harming anybody. You're not harming yourself. And as you care for this, the mind is very clear. which is very different from the pleasures that depend on sensuality. The mind gets clouded with sensuality. And a lot of our desires for sensual pleasures require that we take something from somebody else. And 
when we're nice, we do it when they're willing. But there are a lot of cases where they're not willing at all, and yet we take the pleasure anyhow. We take that for granted. That's why sensual pleasures lower the level of the mind. When you lift them up to this level, the pleasure that comes from simply inhabiting your body, saturating it with good breath energy, saturating it with a sense of well-being, you begin to get more sensitive. You realize this is a better pleasure. More constant, filling more of your awareness. And it's also a pleasure that's related to skill. We're not just sitting here on the receiving end of something really nice. We're also developing that sense of accomplishment that comes when you've mastered a skill. The self, as the producer, gets to produce things well. And as you master this as a skill, you start adopting the Four Noble Truths, because the Four Noble Truths are a way of looking at things that are very directly related to someone who wants to master a skill. Where are things not going well? What's causing it? How can you attack the cause? And what do you have to do to attack the cause? In this case, you're trying to develop your sensitivity to well-being, which also requires that you develop your sensitivity to pain, stress, suffering. Here again, you've got a Pali word that has many ranges of meaning, dukkha, everywhere from really harsh suffering up to a very subtle sense of disturbance or disease. I was reading a piece recently where someone was saying that there's only one way you can translate dukkha, and that's as suffering. Nothing else captures its essence. But that would mean that there, was, there would be no dukkha at all in concentration, which is not the case. When the mind settles in with a sense of well-being, there's still some stress there, some disturbance. That too is dukkha. If you don't recognize that, you think you've arrived. But when you recognize it, you realize, okay, there's still something wrong. It's still not skillful enough. And that encourages you to look for a better sense of well-being, something that's not fabricated. Because concentration is about as good as you can get with fabrication. The best bodily fabrication, the best verbal fabrication, the best mental fabrication, they're all right here in concentration. But concentration is only as good as fabrication could be, and fabrication still has its drawbacks. It comes and it goes, and it requires that you maintain it. That's a lot of the stress and disturbance right there. It requires constant looking after. As John Lee once said, Nirvana is what's easy. It's the pleasures of the world that are hard. And here we'd, we'd include jhana as one of the pleasures of the world, because you have to look after it. You have to tend to it. It's always threatening to go away. Whereas Nirvana, once you've found it, doesn't require any looking after at all. So as we lift the mind, we make it more sensitive. And as it becomes more sensitive, you get more demanding as to what would be a satisfactory source of happiness, what would count as happiness. And you get more sensitive to what counts as dukkha. It's not just suffering. It's stress as well, disturbance, any slight burdensomeness. Simply the sense that you have a duty. You've got this duty with regard to the path that you've got to maintain it. 
That weighs on the mind. Now, if you've been coming fresh from being involved in sensuality and getting finally a sense of mastery over the concentration, maintaining the concentration doesn't seem like that much of a burden because it repays you many times over. But as your sensitivity develops, you realize you want something better. And it was part of the Buddha's genius to realize there, there actually is something better. His teachers were stuck on the ultimate level of concentration. Couldn't drop it because they thought if they dropped it, what would they have? Nothing. But the Buddha learned that if you bring the mind to that threshold, get to the point where there is no fabrication, then another dimension opens, another dimension entirely, where there is no dukkha at all. And it's a sense of well-being that's so unlike fabricated well-being that there are passages where the Buddha says you go beyond pleasure and pain, others where he says it is the ultimate sukha. Which is enough to communicate the fact that it's not like anything you've known, but it's better. The mind raises itself to the point where it's worthy of this. That's what we're doing as we practice.